So would Russia really use nuclear weapons? Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov telling CNN that would only be if Moscow faced an existential threat, and certainly not in the current campaign in Ukraine. Is that simply stating the obvious, or just hours before Joe Biden lands in Europe for a NATO summit, should we worry? Last month, on the eve of the invasion, Peskov's boss made a thinly veiled threat to the West if they tried to stop him. After recent uh, Russian war games that included the eventuality of nuclear war, and as European nations imparts stockpile things like iodine pills just in case, would Vladimir Putin really dare to go where neither side ever went during the Cold War? We'll also ask about the West's resolve in the wake of Volodymyr Zelensky's speech before the uh, French Parliament, one where he named and shamed companies that continue to do business in Russia. Again, all this ahead of Joe Biden's arrival in Europe for a summit with leaders of NATO, the G7 and EU. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at what looks like the next phase in the war of the, in Ukraine. And joining us, uh, French member of parliament, uh, Mireille Clapeau from Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche party. Thanks for being with us. Hello. Uh, we are also joined from Warsaw uh, by journalist uh, Vladislav Davidson. You are the author of From Odessa with Love, Political and Literary Essays from Post-Soviet and Ukraine. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me again. And from London, Nikolai Petrov, Senior Research Fellow uh, for the Russia and Eurasia Program at the think tank uh, Chatham House. Nice to see you again. My pleasure. The France 24 debate where you can join the conversation and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. If it's Wednesday, it must be Paris. continuing his virtual tour of world parliaments with a speech by video link before a French National Assembly where Volodymyr Zelensky evoked the ruins of the World War I Battle of Verdun to denounce the pounding of cities like Mariupol. And he also called on French companies to quit Russia. Tanks, anti-tank weapons, combat aircraft, air defenses, you can help us. We need help so that freedom does not lose. The world must support with sanctions against the aggressor. Every week there should be a package of new sanctions. French companies must leave the Russian market, Renault, Le Roi Merlin, Auchan and others. They must stop sponsoring the Russian war machine. Yeah, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, in that speech, before I ask you about the, the, the issue of those companies, first of all, the, the, the mood at, at the parliament, because it's it's... We're now kind of getting used to seeing him do this before all the parliaments. He did Japan, by the way, earlier in the day. You sit there, all the parliamentarians together, and you're watching this virtual screen. What, what was it like being there for, for that? Well, it was very solemn. Uh, I would like to remind that uh, we were in our constituencies and where we were informed that Vl Vladimir Zelensky uh, would address uh, to, to, to the parliament uh, we all uh, came back uh, from our constituencies because it so was... So this was a special session. Yes, exactly. Uh, it lasted um, 15 minutes. It was so impressive uh, to, to see him. We know what is uh, his personal situation, what uh, he's uh, representing. And uh, we had, of course, uh, some special thoughts uh, for the Ukrainian people. So it was uh, very stirring, very moving. So you, you heard him in, the, in that uh, clip. He calls out... Uh, the French car company Renault, the supermarket chain Auchan, the DIY uh, shop Le Roi Merlin, for continuing to do business in Russia. Is he right? Well, um, he told that uh, to members of parliament who have uh, no right, no power on this decision. It will be a decision of, of the companies. Some of the companies already left Russia. Uh, because uh, uh, they don't produce uh, the, the products they sell um, in-house in, in Russia. But for Auchan and uh, Le Roi Merlin, most of uh, the products they sell uh, are made in Russia. We will see it's their own decision. Uh, what will be the, the situation if they leave uh, Russia? Certainly there will be a nationalization from Russia. So will it really help 
the, uh, the uh, uh, fire seas uh, in uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, we don't know. It was something new. That it was expressed from uh, some um, politician in France, but it was the first time that we heard it from uh, the mouth of uh, Vladimir Zelensky himself. N Nikolai Petrov, if those companies leave Russia, does that help Ukraine? I don't think so, uh, to be sincere. It seems to me that those French companies which did already leave from Russia, uh, well, uh, did play more important role, like, say, Tatal or uh, those luxury brands uh, which left. But uh, those companies which are remaining are connected to consumption, uh, to mass consumption, and uh, ordinary Russians uh, for sure uh, will feel uh, their absence, but uh, it will not help uh, anyhow to stop the war. I do totally agree with President Zelensky that everything should be done in order to stop the war as soon as possible, but I do not see how it can help if remaining French companies will leave from Russia now. Well, let's talk about Renault for a second. Uh, the car maker, which the French uh, state owns a controlling state, a stake in it, um, it's uh, restarted its Moscow plant on Monday. That only lasted three days because they had a lack of parts. They were forced to shut down. They also control Russia's biggest car maker, Aftovaz. When you've got the French state, which has this controlling shareholder stake in Renault, well, it is in the end Emmanuel Macron's decision whether or not Renault should pull out of Russia. Well, it, uh, Renault, it's um, private owned. Uh, it's not a uh, it's not a publicly uh, owned company. Uh, Renault is a very difficult situation because part of his uh, business uh, is made there, and they have uh, some difficulties to maintain the production uh, as you maintain. What will be their decision? We don't know. Um, if uh, they if they decided to stop the production there, uh, certainly uh, it would be a. Uh, something given uh, to the Russian authorities. So uh, we all agree that we have uh, to deprive uh, Russia from resources and not give um, the government some more resources. That's the dilemma. Vladislav Davidson, you agree? Look, the, conceptually, the, the deal that Putin has with the electorate, with the middle class, was that they stay out of politics and they have their nice, shiny St. Petersburg and Moscow lifestyle, and they have this nice life of Western-like consumption. They have Zara, which is now closed. They have 500 Zara stores, which are closed across Russia. They have their, uh, they're supposedly have their nice trips abroad. Uh, they have their kids in schools. They have their, their bank accounts in other places. Once you start closing down the consumption of the middle class, uh, their quality of life drops significantly, and they have to make certain decisions about the kind of country they want to live in. The deal that they had with the Russian state collapsed on February 24th when the Russian army began bombarding Kiev and Mariupol and Kharkiv and Sumy. It started to collapse, you say, but when Mireille Clapeau said, and you heard Nikolai Petrov as well, saying that if a company like Renault pulls out, it doesn't really help Ukraine much. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, for, first of all, you have to, for, from the standpoint of Ukraine, uh, and I'm, I'm now a Ukrainian, uh, uh, I, I, I burned my passport in front of the, my Russian passport in front of the Russian embassy in Paris five days ago. Uh, I mean, does that help anyone in Ukraine? No. I mean, you have to make symbolic statements of what your beliefs are and who you're who you're with and what you feel about a hundred something or two hundred or three hundred Ukrainian kids, little children, babies being killed by Russian cruise bombs, cruiser bombs, cruiser missiles, and Russian carpet bombing of civilian infrastructure. So does it increase the life capacity and living standard of Ukrainians in Sumy and Kharkiv and Odessa? No. But you know price has to be paid and you have to say who it is you are and whose side you're on and what it is you believe. All right. There's the case of uh, companies that are still in. They're the case of those that are left uh, or are leaving slowly, you might say. French energy giant Total Energy, uh, uh, which uh, 
announced on the eve of uh, Zelensky's speech that it's going to stop purchasing Russian oil and petroleum products by the end of the year and also stop its funding for the Arctic LNG2 natural gas project. It's a huge project. Its CEO, though, denounces those who claim Total has blood on its hands. Ces deux soldats ukrainiens, ce sont deux employés de Total Energy. Ce sont les deux héros de mon entreprise aujourd'hui. Et on nous accuse de crime, mais ce n'est pas acceptable. On est des gens responsables. On prend le temps de réfléchir. On me dit, retirez-vous de Russie. Je lâche tout, j'arrête d'amener le gaz russe aux Européens qui en ont besoin, alors que les gouvernements européens nous disent de continuer puisqu'ils ne veulent pas le sanctionner. Et pourquoi ils ne veulent pas le sanctionner Parce que sans gaz russe, on arrête une partie de l'économie européenne. Et moi, je dois décider tout seul, parce que je suis PDG d'un grand groupe, j'arrête le gaz russe, j'arrête le pétrole russe. Le... Ben, on cherche des solutions. So, Vladislav Davidson, you agree? You can't just one day to the next snap your fingers and uh, stop importing oil and gas? Look, obviously we're in the middle of a winter. Obviously there are security considerations. Obviously there are, there are people who are dependent on this. But at the end of the day, we are you know, funding the Russian administration. We're funding what is now a dictatorship to the tune of a billion dollars a day or, or more in, in oil and gas receipts. And ultimately, we are responsible for that. And we have to stop as, as the West. We have to make a decision that this is what we are willing to do. And if the, if the Germans have to freeze a winter, uh, if they have to, you know, buckle their belts and tighten their belts and, and accept the fact that, that there's a consequence to 15, 20 years of their policies and that they have to accept that fact that their economy will go into recession. I mean, th th these are the decisions they made 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, be good Europeans and, you know, suck it up. Mireille Clapeau, uh, BP, Shell, they left. Total is doing a slow exit. Why is that? I would like to mention a French law uh, that um, uh, forces companies to evaluate their impact on the human rights and uh, environmental uh, uh, situation. And this is becoming um, a European directive. It was, uh, it was uh, emitted just after the uh, invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine. And I think that this is a good direction we have. And these companies have to evaluate the impact of their production of their business on human rights on the uh, human situation, on the uh, environment. And you, I think it's, uh, it's uh, maybe too short to say uh, this company has a bad impact uh, on uh, Ukraine. We have to measure it and to, to look at it um, separately. And when you hear uh, that Total is suing the Green Party candidate for president, Yannick Jadot, for libel, for saying that the oil giant has blood on its hands, what's your reaction? Maybe, uh, well, we are in a, a presidential uh, campaign uh, and uh, maybe we shouldn't use uh, some, so strong expression like uh, having a blood on, uh, on uh, his hands. I think uh, it's too extreme, but it's true that we have uh, to look very carefully whether uh, Total Energies or other company um, have an impact, again, uh, on the situation in Ukraine. And, uh, I don't know for the moment. Uh, I, I cannot answer to, the question, to this question. Nikolai Petrov, can you answer to this question? I would say that uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, too easy uh, to blame businessmen or somebody else, but uh, not ourselves. Uh, all of us, and uh, I personally, because I am citizen of Russian Federation, uh, do bear certain responsibility for what's going on. But uh, let's be rational in a sense uh, that sanctions, at least at this stage, are very painful for both sides, not only for Russia, but for those countries which do implement these sanctions. Uh, this is not uh, exactly the same with regard to the United States. Uh, 
uh, with much weaker relations uh, with Russia and uh, Europe. And uh, I would uh, say that in each case, we should weigh costs and benefits. And in case something can help to uh, stop the war, it should be done immediately. In other cases, when we speak about some symbolic moves, uh, we should think twice before making those moves, which will be painful from one side and not that uh, much felt by other side. Yeah, France, uh, which is the biggest foreign employer uh, in Russia. And you, you were mentioning those sanctions there. Uh, Vladimir Putin had a word to say about them earlier. He called them illegal and he laid down some new rules. Let's listen. I made a decision to take actions to switch payments for natural gas sold to so-called unfriendly countries into the Russian ruble in the shortest time possible. So Nikolai Petrov, he didn't say oil, he said natural gas there. Uh, what does that mean, a switch to uh, forcing payments in rubles, and can he do it? I think uh, he can claim for certain contracts uh, to be revised, although it takes uh, some time. And uh, what we should have in mind, it's not only the fact that uh, Russia is selling oil and gas, but it's the fact whether Russia is capable to get money for oil and gas sold. And uh, I think that those sanctions which are already implemented uh, do not let Russia to get money for uh, the oil and gas sold. And that's why uh, the idea to switch to ruble or yuan or uh, whatever else is connected not only with the idea somehow asymmetrically to respond to those sanctions which are on the table, but at the same time to let Russian budget and to let Russian companies to get money. Will he get away with it? Will those companies pay in rubles? Uh, well, uh, you know, the uh, problem is uh, that, uh, well, uh, those companies uh, can pay in uh, whichever currency, but uh, it cannot be transferred uh, to Russia and to Russian banks and uh, to their accounts. So I would say that Russian budget, and it's clearly seen in Putin's behavior, is uh, suffering very seriously due to those sanctions which are implemented, not to speak about the next package which is uh, discussed. And uh, I hope that it can play, and it is playing a very important role, but it, it will not play this role immediately. So it will not stop the war uh, tomorrow. It will harm Russia. It will put huge pressure. It will perhaps lead uh, to the the collapse of Putin's regime sometime in future, but not now. But not now. Uh, before, before we move on, uh, one more word about Volodymyr Zelensky's speech. Uh, and you were mentioning, Yai Klapo, that we are in a presidential election season right now. There were three candidates for president uh, who were present in the chamber alongside you, uh, two from the far right, one from the far left. In the past, they've expressed uh, their penchant for Putin uh, uh, and they were in the room for Zelensky's speech. The far-right MP Marine Le Pen, uh, who's polling second behind incumbent Emmanuel Macron, was in attendance after saying she'd uh, cleared an earlier scheduling conflict. Uh, Mireille Clapeau, she arrived late. Uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, what do, you, what do you make of the fact that she considered not coming and then decided to show up in the end? <laughs> uh... Well, I don't know exactly. Uh, I don't uh, really like uh, this uh, woman. Uh, I respect her because uh, she was uh, elected and she's a colleague, a member of parliament. But um, she used to be a, a, a fan, a supporter of uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, her, her party was financed uh, by Russian banks. So he's the, um, isn't, isn't isn't there a partiality in uh, in uh, her mind? Uh, certainly, she has uh, some personal interest and some financial interest uh, towards Russia. Uh, Vladislav Davidson, is there a special thing 
between the French opposition or some of the French opposition candidates and Russia? Uh, certainly, uh, the, the Honorable MP is absolutely correct. Uh, we've known for a long time that there are symmetrical uh, relationships between the, the far left and the far right in, in all over Europe. The, the Russians have excelled at updating the Soviet playbook, uh, at funneling them money. Often it's actually done through the same accounts and through the same agents and through the same relationships. But, uh, you know, had, had held up 20 years ago. So that there's absolutely Russian money in helping. I, I don't know about Melenchon, uh, that, that's up to the French journalists and uh, French colleagues, but, but certainly there's been real historical interest from the Kremlin and from Russian intelligence services and security services in financing the far right and the far left all over Europe. France is at the center of that, unfortunately, that's up, up to the, uh, the gentlewoman that I'm honored enough to be on a, uh, in a, in a debate to look into. Uh, that That's not a new story. That is uh, something that a lot of people have looked into. Uh, also, ideologically, if you step aside from the money issue, ideologically, the far left and the far right in France have a certain kind of temperamental relationship to anti-Americanism, to uh, anti-Brussels politics, to creating havoc within the European Union that is of uh, interest to the Russians to support. So there's also, amongst the far left, there's the historical antecedent, see Moscow as a successor state to the Communist Party, although nothing about the Russian economy could be more anti-worker or more uh, oligarchic. Than, uh, than what we have. There are people, not very bright people, but very nostalgic people within ultra-left French politics who see Moscow and they think, oh, Soviet Union, oh, Putin, oh, friend. So it's not a logical chain of thinking, not at all, but that is how they think. All right, let's take a look at the situation on the ground. Uh, fighting continuing to rage. Uh, we're on the eve of the first uh, month of fighting. The United States unable to confirm uh, Ukrainian claims that, uh, uh, that its forces have taken back the Kyiv suburb of uh, Makariv, that they've made uh, fresh uh, gains uh, to the northwest of the capital uh, in Irpin. What is clear is the Russians uh, have not had a blitzkrieg win. They've still not taken control uh, uh, of uh, Irpin entirely, nor have they taken the besieged southern port city of Mariupol, uh, which uh, has been under a three-week siege. The fear is that if Russia is frustrated on the battlefield, uh, the Kremlin would resort to chemical weapons, like was the case uh, in Syria. There's even a worst-case scenario. CNN asked uh, the Kremlin spokesperson about the nuclear option, uh, Dmitry uh, Peskov, uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, if it is an existential to our threat, then it can be. Of course, Nikolai Petrov, he was quick to say there'd be no nukes used uh, in Ukraine. I don't want to fear monger here. Uh, but would they use nuclear weapons? I asked the question again because we were all a bit spooked when we heard that very menacing speech by Vladimir Putin on the eve of the war, warning the West to stay out of it. I think, unfortunately, it cannot be excluded. And uh, uh, that's why it's uh, dangerous to corner Putin if only those uh, thousands of casualties do not ex uh, impress, uh, well, uh, the other side from his point of view, uh, to make certain concessions and uh, to start real negotiations, then he can use something which uh, will uh, uh, have a kind of uh, shock effect, whether it will be chemical weapons. And uh, it's not by chance that the Ministry of Defense uh, is saying about preparation of uh, from the Ukrainian side to uh, provoke, to make a provocation using chemical weapons. And uh, nuclear 
uh, well, uh, weapons can be used as well, uh, according to Russian military doctrine. Tactical nuclear weapons can be used not only uh, reacting onto the nuclear uh, attack against Russia, but in case uh, there is essential risk for Russian state. And of course, we can uh, see how this can justify any usage of nuclear weapons. God forbid, and perhaps it will never happen, but we should have this in mind. What does tactical nuclear weapons mean? Uh, I grew up during the Cold War where we were told that uh, nuclear weapons were off the table at all times because it was uh, mutually assured destruction. What are tactical nuclear weapons? Well, unlike strategic nuclear weapons, which should be transported uh, for more than 5.5 uh, thousand kilometers, uh, and uh, nuclear, strategic nuclear weapons attack will lead uh, to, it, uh, well, uh, mutual suicide. In case of tactical nuclear weapons, uh, they are more limited, but at the same time, they can, uh, well, uh, uh, cause a kind of a shock reaction. And uh, Russian military doctrine differs between uh, both, unlike, by the way, military doctrines of other nuclear states. How so? Sorry? How so do they differ? Well, the difference is uh, connected with the, uh, with the fact that uh, a real strategic nuclear weapons attack will mean, uh, well, uh, for sure, uh, suicide for the side which uh, starts this attack and from, for the other side. But, uh, well, in case of using tactical weapons, it uh, is considered by Russian military. And the problem is that Russian military, uh, as well as many other military in the world, do not have the personal experience of either participating in the war, serious war, or uh, even participating in, uh, well, uh, exercises uh, when nuclear weapons uh, have been tried. And uh, in this case, uh, they can uh, calculate uh, that uh, the very fact, the very usage of this very limited usage of uh, tactical nuclear weapon uh, can decide uh, the fate uh, and can push the other side uh, to concessions. Mihai uh, Klapo, it's a delicate matter to broach because it's been the question on everybody's lips. I'm sure your constituents, the first question they ask you oftentimes about what's going on in Ukraine is, is there going to be a nuclear war? And we've seen the European Union talking about stockpiling iodine pills, something that some of the countries are already doing. Uh, they've run out in pharmacies in places. Uh, it could just be panic buying. It, you know, th this is a, this is a, such an unfathomable scenario, but are we right to be talking about this? Is this an important, are we right to be considering this at this point? I think the, the most probable uh, hypothesis is that uh, Russia uses a chemical and a biological uh, weapons because, uh, uh, first of all, um, they, they use a subject accusing uh, Ukraine uh, from uh, having um, uh, labo laboratories uh, held by uh, Americans. And second, we know that um, Russia used uh, chemical weapons against uh, Skripal and, uh, and uh, Alexei Navalny too, because it was uh, a poisoning. Uh, so I think it, will, it could be next step. And of course, uh, nuclear weapon uh, would be uh, something terrible. And uh, my first reaction is, um, to tell you, no, it's uh, such a uh, horrible uh, hypothesis that uh, it yeah, will never Yeah, what do you say to happen. constituents when they ask you? What do you? What's your answer when they say, is there going to be a nuclear war? What do you say? The problem is that uh, with uh, Putin, we, we never know, because before the morning of um, 24th of February, uh, I would have swore that, uh, no, never, uh, Putin will never attack uh, Ukraine. So... We, we, in fact, we don't know, <laughs> and uh, the weapons uh, um, exist. And uh, when weapons exist uh, in uh, such hands as uh, Putin's hands, uh, you never know.
Uh, let me let me turn to fellow journalist uh, Vladislav Davidson on this. Uh, again, it's the question of uh, how do you talk about this in a responsible manner without uh, unnecessarily making people afraid? I, I would like to think that uh, citizens of Europe and America and of the West will, will react appropriately and responsibly. And that, you know, these threats from basically a thug, a dictator, someone who, you know, people make an argument to become a fascist in the last month, and I'm not going to make a counter-argument about like Trump, you know, he's saying these things in order to dissuade us from helping the Ukrainians, uh, plucky liberal democracy, a messy liberal democracy, chaotic liberal democracy, but a liberal democracy full of extraordinarily brave people fighting for their future, uh, you know, we're trying to dissuade, uh, uh, he's trying to dissuade us from helping these people, the, the Ukrainians. We should not be going in for that kind of blackmail. We should not be going in for that kind of blackmail, if only because it uh, dissuades the entire logic of mutually assured destruction, right? Uh, if, if the intercontinental ballistic strategic nukes are, are, is not something we are afraid of. Why are we, you know, why are we going to bow down to threats of tactical nuclear missiles? If we are already arming the Ukrainians, there's no reason not to give them everything. Here in Warsaw, uh, where I am right now, I'm waiting for Biden to arrive. As I'm reporting, Polish intellectuals and Polish foreign policy people and Polish elites ask me, "You're Russian. You're Ukrainian." Uh, it, are they really going to uh, go after Poland, as uh, uh, the, the, the former Russian president said? Um, what, do you, what do you say to them? You know, you have to hold your ground. You have to stand up. And we can't be blackmailed by Putin with nukes. Well, uh, one man who agrees with uh, Mireille Clapeau's assessment that uh, the, the uh, grim but not as grim uh, scenario that we have to watch out for is chemical weapons is the president of the United States. We're speaking ahead of Joe Biden Day in Brussels Thursday. There's going to be three summits, including the one with NATO leaders. The U.S. president earlier spoke to reporters uh, on his way out of the White House. I think it's a real threat. He thinks it's a real threat, uh, the use uh, of chemical weapons. Earlier, when we spoke to France 24's uh, Brussels correspondent uh, Dave Keating, he said that right now at NATO, uh, they're either playing their cards close to their chest or still working out just uh, what red lines would mean. We saw in Syria that uh, it was announced by the U.S. president and others that uh, chemical weapons were a red line. They were used. Uh, there was no uh, intervention. Uh, at this point in time, Vladislav Davidson, what should be the reaction of NATO if Russia uses chemical weapons in Ukraine? They should give every gun and every anti-ballistic missile and every tank and every plane that the Ukrainians have been pleading for for the last month to Kiev immediately. I mean, there's, there's, there's no ifs and ifs about it. You just have to go all in. There is concern here in Poland amongst various Ukrainian political elites who I've been speaking to that the Biden administration is not doing quite enough. There is concern amongst people close to the Ukrainian presidential administration, who I've been speaking with, that the um, Biden administration looks like it's doing enough, but really isn't. That really is a plain. But, but, but let me ask you, Vladislav, what more, what more can they do? I mean, there are those Javelin anti-tank missiles. Uh, there have been, uh, uh, there's been ammunition sent in, uh, and it's not just the United States. It's uh, it's uh, all NATO allies and even beyond who've been uh, pouring in uh, military aid to Ukraine in the past month. There are offensive weapons. Uh, and again, I don't have security clearance, so I haven't seen the list. But I'm told that there are offensive weapons that the Ukrainians want that they're not getting yet. I'm told by people who have uh, are above my pay grade in terms of what they have access to with their eyes that there are things that the Ukrainians are asking for that they're not getting, including I'm sitting here in Poland, this, the question of the MiGs. The, I mean, it's symbolic, 
uh, but the Ukrainian Air Force is still flying and it's still fighting, and we should be giving them the mix. We should be giving them the uh, anti-missile and anti-airplane uh, uh, defense systems. There are people here and there are people in Kiev. Yeah, just to, just to remind our viewers on this, uh, the, the, the uh, Poland uh, was asking if they could give those Soviet-era uh, uh, made planes that the Ukrainians know how to fly. The question, Vladislav, was that the Americans are saying, uh, how do you get them into Ukraine? Uh, because if you fly them in, then you're involved in the war then. I, I, look, I, I think that's I think that's a kind of sidestepping of the issue by the by the uh, uh, American presidential administration. Is We've it? already given so much. We, yeah, I think it is. I, I think it's a pretext for not doing what they really don't want to do. I think the, I think there are elements in inside the White House uh, who will not be named on uh, national television, international television, who want, want to uh, keep this conflict. Uh, going uh, in a way that bleeds the Russian military or don't want to uh, go all in because they need the Russians on uh, negotiations with Iran or they need them on something else quietly. There, are, there is a calculation. They're not, go they're not saying we will give the Ukrainians everything. They're coming up with some sort of silly pretext or a kind of technical procedural pretext for not giving it. There are ways to give the planes. W what is the difference between giving javelins and planes across the border. I just don't see the difference. Nikolai Petrov, I'm haunted by what you said earlier about uh, Vladimir Putin feeling cornered already. Uh, he, he, listening there to Vladimir uh, uh, speaking, uh, your thoughts. Is there a difference between giving javelins and giving uh, uh, MiGs? I think there is uh, the difference. And uh, I, I, I would agree. Uh, uh, that uh, the United States are trying to avoid escalation of the conflict because uh, it will be almost impossible to stop this uh, escalation. But what is important, I think, uh, it's not only to discuss uh, how exactly and what kind of weapons uh, can be given to uh, Ukrainian army in order to resist, but to think in terms of scenarios for future. And uh, I would say that, in my view, Ukraine did already win in moral sense, but it cannot win uh, militarily against Russian army, which is much stronger. That's why uh, I, I would agree with those who are saying that instead of escalating the conflict and instead of sending new and new weapons. And it's, it's limited, not only in terms of uh, transportation, it's limited in terms of how exactly uh, Ukrainian army uh, will become capable to use more sophisticated uh, weapons and, uh, and so on. It's, uh, it's, it's a threat all the time, because Vladimir Putin did already uh, tell that uh, in case uh, any other state will do something uh, to intervene, uh, it should be considered by Russia as uh, part of this war uh, against Russia, and uh, there should be there should be the response. So my point is that we should see. Uh, to the future to understand what exactly can be done to stop the war right now, not to uh, let it to continue for longer, but to stop it now. And how do you do that? Uh, in my view, what is needed, uh, it's needed to uh, negotiate and to push uh, Russian army out of Ukraine. So I would consider the option to keep or even to strengthen sanctions against Russian political regime uh, in this case, but uh, at the beginning to reach any kind of agreement, to have a ceasefire and uh, to uh, let Russian troops to, to, to go out, not uh, just to pay thousands of Ukrainian life, uh, lives uh, for keeping the war on daily basis. But we've seen the, the, the Russians uh, violate the ceasefire uh, accords that have happened uh, locally on a piecemeal basis. It doesn't sound so far 
like uh, the uh, the Russians, especially if you heard the comments earlier of the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, like the Russians uh, are really intent on striking any kind of a deal soon. Well, you know, if to think in terms uh, that uh, Russian political regime uh, will uh, violate any agreements which can be reached, then we should not do anything uh, just due to this fact. But I think it's possible to uh, agree on certain terms uh, to meet certain uh, claims made by Putin to negotiate about other claims to have this temporary uh, ceasefire to end the war and then to let uh, Russian political regime to, to die uh, on its own. Do you agree, Vladislav Davidson? I couldn't agree less. I, 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 I really could not agree less with the honorable gentleman and uh, my, my fellow former uh, countrymen. I no longer consider myself to be a Russian citizen. Uh, no, I couldn't agree less. The, the, the Putin administration will go in, all in. Uh, uh, they're all in already. They've swallowed and locked in the costs of sanctions and all the other uh, costs that they're going to have to swallow and keep tolerating. And they're going to go in as much as they can until they get some sort of victory on the ground. The, the fastest way to conclude this war is to give the Ukrainians whatever it is they need to win. The Ukrainians need to be given every weapon and every tool that they need to win this conflict. And the, the Russians will not back out until the, they've, they're, they're feeling the, the costs from the Russian population. Who, who, when Russian mothers say, you have to bring my boy home, that's the only thing that will get Russians out of Ukraine, is more ammo, more fuel, more anti-tank missiles, more MiGs. You have to give the Ukrainians everything they need in order to win this war. And I could not agree with a gentleman less. I'm sad Mire to say. Mireille Clapeau. Personally, I believe uh, in a combination of uh, sanctions and uh, information, the two major weapons, sanctions, because um, they are increasing and they are based on a unanimity, so Putin uh, didn't expect that, so certainly they will, uh, uh, they will uh, reach their target. And second, uh, I... I have the impression we can't uh, rely on the, the, the move in the public opinion in Russia uh, because we have a weapon, it's information, not images. And there were uh, already uh, 10,000 losses among uh, the Russian uh, sol uh, soldiers. And certainly something uh, can move if the Russian people can have access to uh, reliable uh, information. And we don't want escalation and we have to, to keep a strong uh, family on these two weapons. You know, this show... Functions on information. You know, we're banned in Russia right now, France 24. So if they're watching us, it's on. It's with a VPN, you know, uh, get, getting around the, the, the firewall. Uh, can you really reach people in Russia? At every level, uh, we can uh, reach them, of course, for the moment. Uh, every region, uh, we... we um, uh, we try to reach, uh, they are involved uh, in this uh, propaganda, so they don't want uh, to believe us. But certainly, uh, they can realize what uh, is Russia doing in Ukraine. Let me ask you, I said earlier it was Joe Biden Day on Thursday with all those summits that are taking place uh, in, in Brussels. Is he the right man for, for, for this moment? We've talked a lot about Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, how he's uh, gone into the spotlight since uh, the start of this no, war. How about Joe Biden? Yes, uh, of course. I think uh, that uh, he has a very important uh, role uh, to play. I don't know. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, 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 NATO plus uh, the United States uh, plus the Western countries uh, plus uh, uh, G7 uh, plus uh, European Union certainly uh, it was it will have an impact. We're almost out of time, so just quickly around the room, Vladimir Davidson. What are you, uh, Vladislav Davidson? Excuse me. What are you expecting from Joe Biden? Uh, I, I'm expecting a lot more than what we're getting. I'm going to be in the minority. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I I would like the well-intentioned people in America who think that the Biden administration is doing as much as they can to understand that they're not. They could be doing more. They could be giving more weapons. Uh, they're, they're trying to bleed the, the the Russian the Russian army dry to the last uh, Ukrainian soldier who will fight. Uh, they really would prefer to have some sort of 
uh, go around of the bipartisan American congressional uh, consensus on arming the Ukrainians to the teeth. I think they're doing as little as that they can get away with. That's my personal opinion. And I'm not a Republican, for the record. I've not. Uh, I've never voted for a Republican in my entire life, just so everybody knows. Um, that's 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 my piece. I really hope. When Ni Biden Nikolai Petrov, your final word on this. I would say that uh, although I am sure that Russia cannot win this war, I am also sure that this war cannot be win against Russia. That's why. Uh, the position of the American side and of President Biden, I think it's pretty well balanced and rational uh, in terms of sanctions and in terms of using or not using weapons. And we'll leave it there. We'll, of course, have full coverage of those summits taking place in Brussels on Thursday. I want to thank you, Nikolai Petrov, for joining us uh, from London. Vladislav Davidson in Warsaw. Mireille Klepo, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.